Hey everyone, I'm not wearing any pants. Or am I? You'll never know. Uh, except that I just told you, but you'll never really know. So this is The Medium, developed by Bloober Team and released on January 28th, 2021. It's a horror adventure game centered around protagonist Marianne, the titular Medium, as she explores the abandoned Niwa Resort and uncovers devastating secrets about her family. Look who finally decided to let me out of my cage. To be honest, I played this game back when it was on Xbox Game Pass, I believe around the time it first came out, and I really had no idea what to do with that experience. I just left the game feeling very apathetic and a little confused, and I, though I can remember playing the game last year, I really truly don't remember how I felt about it, which says a lot, I think. This video I'm making right now isn't 100% original. I was going to make a video this month about an indie game, Black Book, which is really fucking good. Like it's such a good, solid card building, deck building RPG uh, with like different choices and everything. Um, but it's also like really long. But if you get the chance to play Black Book on Steam, go play it. It's, I had so much fucking fun with it. That video is gonna come eventually, um, but yeah, it's, it's a very long game, so this is what you get instead. I'm sorry. That's just how the world works. After watching videos by Bob Vids, James Stephanie Sterling, and Mert KK, all having to do with Bloober Team and their shitty approaches to writing mental health, I figured, hey, I'm a loudmouth on YouTube, and I've played the medium. Why don't I talk about my experience with it? Problem, I don't remember my experience with it, so I just played through it again. This video will be discussing violence, sexual violence, and self-harm, among other topics, so please click away if that's just not palatable for you at this time, okay? Okay. Uh, I used to make these videos on my channel called Real Talk Videos, um, and I mean, I've only made two of them, but I it's just sort of talking about me instead of you know trying to make this big, um, artistic expression. So this is a bit of a bit of a mini real talk video. Full disclosure, I'm a depressed bastard. I've been clinically diagnosed with depression and anxiety, and I have self-harmed in the past many, many years ago. So that's the background I'm coming into this video game with. If you're feeling any of these things yourself or struggling with your mental health, please don't suffer in silence. Find someone to speak to, and if you can afford it, consider speaking to a professional whom you trust. I'm not an excuse for therapy, I'm not a counselor, and though I understand it may feel burdensome at times, it's never worth shouldering the mental struggles on your own. You didn't get into this world on your own, you shouldn't uh, have to deal with it on your own. Uh, the reason I bring this all up is because mental health is a topic I regularly broach in my own writing and music. My last album, for instance, Twilight Supernova, was the portrait of a father struggling to think about how he can raise his adoptive daughter while coping with his own feelings of anxiety and inadequacy. Writing these stories is therapeutic for me, and it's useful in helping me take a step back and consider my own actions during difficult emotional situations. As someone who loves Radiohead and Metal Gear, I really appreciate seeing realistic, if difficult, uh, portrayals of mental health struggles in media. Even if it's depressing, like True Love Waits, or Kendrick Lamar's Mother I Sober, or We Cry Together, just moving through the experience of a realistic emotional expression can help dull the isolation that often comes of having these emotional struggles in the first place. Also, it's just damn good art. But Bloober Team, I don't know, it's definitely genuine. It's not like some stories where they pull the mom has cancer card or something just to generate an emotional response where there otherwise wouldn't be one. I feel like this story is being very honest in its portrayal and it's trying its best, but damn, it just doesn't hit the mark, I don't think. Full disclosure part two, usually when I know I'm going to talk about a game, I go on a blackout. In this case, I couldn't do that. I'm writing this script after having watched the aforementioned videos by Mert KK, James Stephanie Sterling, and Bob Vids. Links will be in the description, by the way, so while I'm doing my best to make sure all the ideas in here are my own, there may be times when our opinions overlap. 
So here we go. All right, can we just start here? This fucking wallpaper, I can't stand it. And I wanna see if it's just me, just take a look at it. Give it a few moments, write down your thoughts, and then I'll tell you why I don't like it. All right, the reason I don't like this wallpaper, and maybe it's just me, is because it looks like she's giving a blowjob. <laughs> like, come on. And this game does touch upon the topic of sex, rape specifically, but this wallpaper has nothing to do with that. So every time I see it, it's just fucking distracting. Maybe my stupid sex addiction is getting the better of me here. Like, is it just me? Maybe it's just me. Anyway, onto the real shit. The hot button topic surrounding this game, as I understand it, is twofold. Fold one, the game seems to suggest that people who have been through trauma or struggle with mental illness are broken beyond repair and will inevitably hurt those around them. Fold two, the game seems to write off sexual abuse as something beyond an individual's control. In doing so, as Steph Sterling puts it, The medium comes across a lot like it sympathizes with pedophiles. It focuses on Richard's trauma to the point of essential absolution, portraying his actions as beyond his control and expecting the audience to feel pity rather than disgust. Now, addressing Fold two first, does it? Yeah, it, it, it kind of does. Before we get into that, I need to introduce two characters. This is Lillianne, also known as Sadness, also known as the Maw. They're three parts of the same person, with Lillianne proper being the living person, Sadness being a sort of subconscious representation of her psyche after her trauma, and the Maw being akin to her id, or her desire for carnage and violence. Though, fuck if the game ever tells you this thing's name. There are several instances where the game seems to only tell you a creature's name through subtitles, which are optional. Also, the Maw is voiced by Troy Baker, of all people. That's like, wow, the guy's got range. You first meet Lily in the form of Sadness, who unfortunately gets the David Cage child character treatment as she goes along. Mommy, oh, she was so pretty, but, but so sad, just like you. But when you first meet her, she's a pretty neat character and her design's really cool. The dynamic between her and Marianne is really cute early on and thematically, it makes sense that she becomes more sullen and depressed as she recalls more about her past, but it turns sadness, this facet of Lillianne, into less of a character and more of a narrative device. Anyway, this other character is Richard, Lily's spiritual uncle, so to speak. Uh, essentially, Richard becomes obsessed with Lily after living in close proximity with her at the Nevo Resort. You know that, don't you? You're special. Her voice, is that sadness? She reminded him of a childhood love named Rose who was taken by Gestapo troops during World War II. His obsession turned sexual and he rapes Lily when she's around 13 years old. So the game tells you this, or it doesn't tell you, it does this super annoying thing where it like beats around the bush. No, I didn't mean to. What have I done? What have you done? like he's obsessed. My 13 year old daughter. Did you do it? And it's frustrating because this actually confused me when I first played the game. As I mentioned, I first played this game with PC Game Pass and during this cutscene, an achievement popped up called The Child Eater. And I actually had to tab out of the game to figure out why I got it. Turns out this thing, Richard's id, is The Child Eater. And this is how I learned its name. And I don't know about you guys, but I never heard the term child eater before. I assumed it meant some cannibal type thing, but I was rightfully thinking up until I saw that name pop up in the achievement that Richard raped Lily. So with the game dancing around saying what actually happened, I was super fucking confused. Maybe I'm just a dumbass, but I'm just detailing my experiences here. You're him, Richard. Anyway, the game strongly hints that Richard raped Lily when she was 13. Then it goes on like this 30 minute apology tour. It goes over like everything that's ever gone wrong in Richard's life. How his dad fought for the Polish army and never came back. How his stepfather abused him and sexually abused his mother. And how his Jewish childhood love was taken by Gestapo. But like, 
doesn't matter. He did a bad thing. He made a bad choice. Lily's father, or the ghost of Lily's father, it's complicated. He says it best. Okay, Richard. I get the picture. Doesn't change a goddamn thing. At first, it's like, all right, if this whole it was the demon in me thing was just Richard's justification for what he did, then whatever. That's a character flaw, not a narrative flaw. It wasn't me, Thomas. You have to understand. There's this thing inside of me. You have to believe me. I wanted to die. But for the game to go so far out of its way to be like, no, this demon inside him was crazy and huge and it looks like a ball sack and it's got big old hentai tentacles and shit. There's something here. It awoke on the day when she came to him. It took over. Ah, what was that? It's like something stirred inside him. Please, mister, I need help. The monster, it's after me. It's like, all right, calm, calm the fuck the down, down, game. Down, down, down. I get it. He had a traumatic childhood. He still did a bad thing. For the game's takeaway to be, it wasn't him. It was some rogue impulse he had no control over is completely tone deaf. But did you know he had a really bad life, though? I need you to bring me that thing. You know which one. Yeah, real specific. Oh, what? You want a bedtime story? I'm not your goddamn mother. Oh, you little shit. I'll teach you some respect. Trauma doesn't make you a rapist. There's no crime of passion with this sort of thing. He made an awful choice that severely hurt a young girl. This game doesn't take place in 2022, so there's some leeway for the game to be like, well, mental health treatment doesn't exist like it does now. So someone with that kind of attraction to minors couldn't get the proper help to deal with that. But the game seems to bend over backwards to excuse him of the crime, to separate the obsession from the man but that division becomes non-existent once he acts on that impulse. And going beyond, that courtesy doesn't extend to the other characters. Henry, this guy who just shows up, is literally just an asshole. Basically, Henry is this government agent who's looking for the secret behind Thomas's powers, Thomas being Lily and Marianne's father. So Henry decides in order to do so, he's going to set the house on fire and burn the children out of existence. Here. Yeah. You're sick, Just to rile Thomas up as a torture method. I'm sorry, enhanced interrogation as the US calls it. That's his whole thing. He's just a bad person. What the hell are you? What exactly were you hoping to find here? A guilty conscience? The vulnerable child behind the monster? There is no child. There is only. He gets to own his bad decisions. Also, I didn't know where to fit this in, but this scene is like directly stolen from Pan's Labyrinth, right? Like, right? Maybe I'm wrong, but like, right though? Then we come back to Lily who, she's like a trauma magnet, the trauma center, if you will. It's not bad enough that she's the victim of sexual abuse, but she also lost her mother at a very young age, got nearly killed in a fire, and was locked in a small room in a bunker after her demon got out. Lily is made to suffer the consequences of her trauma over and over, and I guess the game sees Richard hurting her as a consequence of his trauma, but that's not him suffering, that's her. The overarching message seems to be that trauma expands exponentially from person to person, so if we're following the chain, Richard hurt Lily, whose demon then went on to cause a mass murder, who eventually causes the protagonist, Marianne, to kill herself, probably. And even that so far isn't so out there. Aside from that weird apology tour and whoever the fuck Henry is, I'm kind of on board with this demon story. It's not so totally out of the realm of possibility that somebody hurt like she was would want to inflict pain on others. All the shit she went through was a bit excessive, but you know, whatever. It's even really interesting in a macabre sort of way how the Maw describes what it wants. It wants to wear people like a skin suit. Nice. 
it makes my stomach turn. It feels genuine. It feels like the game is really trying to explore the psyche of this damaged girl. We finally see its real form, this ghastly stitching together of parts. The bottom half of the face is completely torn away. The shoulders and upper body are oddly feminine, but shredded and skinned, potentially to symbolize how Lily felt about her own body after her assault. But at the end of the game, we find Lily, now an adult woman, Marianne's older sister, and the game is just like, nah, she's a lost cause, fam. It all ends in me. But, no, no, no. You can't send a spirit away while the host is still alive. That's why you couldn't destroy the monster. Twice, the game straight up says you can't save everyone, which on paper is not a bad sentiment. I would imagine it being told to some kind of hero character or someone experiencing survivor's guilt to help them ease into the reality that sometimes bad things just happen and there's no willing yourself out of it. Anyway, this idea of survivor's guilt reminds me of a quote from a Big Joel video. I was there. I could have done something and didn't. What's wrong with me? But here's the thing. We're not supposed to honor survivor guilt as a rational impulse, right? No, we're supposed to lovingly dismiss it, assure the survivors that they did not do a bad thing, and help them get over their trauma. But the belief that an empathetic gaze is always appropriate, that more empathy is always better, has created a situation where we feel too much, where we accept the narratives of our subjects without a second thought. He's 100% right, of course, but the medium sees that and says, no, you are supposed to indulge your most irrational impulses. The game uses the you can't save everyone line to say, look, this person is so depressed that this demon they're harboring is unstoppable. So they just gotta die. Please don't I'm make sorry. me do this. It's the only way to destroy it, to prevent further bloodshed. Lily? And then Marianne's like, but what if I die instead? And it's the most dumb, bullshit, confusing mess of an ending. Essentially, the Maw keeps wearing people out, literally, because their spiritual energy isn't strong enough to contain it. But because Marianne's a medium and Lily's sister, the Maw believes that wearing Marianne will allow it to last and wreak havoc for a long time. And somehow Marianne decides that means that killing herself will stop it somehow. Like, It'll still exist, idiot. It already caused a mass murder without her. None of the other characters spend any time coming up with a real solution, so the narrative seems to suggest that the only way to win is not to play. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But actually, sort of, like, Lily was doomed from the start. It's radical determinism. The moment she was raped, or maybe the moment her mother died giving birth to Marianne, Lily was marked unsalvageable. And that's it. Any choice she made or agency she had up until this point has been meaningless. And I just don't know what to do with that. Oh no. I'm getting sucked into some kind of video essay wormhole, aren't I? Alright, just fucking take me. Death Stranding video, I'm gonna have to put you on hold. Oh, all right. It looks exactly the same in here. What are we talking about? Oh, okay. I, I can do this. Midsummer is a 2019 cult horror film directed by Ari Aster, which centers around a young woman, Danny, who takes a trip with her emotionally absent boyfriend and his self-occupied friends to Sweden to take part in the titular Midsummer Cultural Festival in a remote Swedish commune. Now, I really fucking love this movie. If you haven't watched it, you, you should. Spoiler alert, by the way. There's a lot to analyze here about the nature of cult and hiding in plain sight and deceit and communication and what have you, but that would all be way beyond the scope of this video. No, the reason I bring up Midsummer in this context is because of the film's exploration of trauma. Last spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the film and you haven't turned the video off yet, I don't know what to tell you because we're going full hog with this one. Raw, no condom. Here we go. So the inciting event of the film is that Danny's sister, who suffers with bipolar disorder, threatens and then goes through with an act of murder-suicide, which claims her and her parents' lives. 
Danny already suffers from major anxiety attacks, insomnia, and feels a great deal of tension stemming from her waning relationship with her douchebag boyfriend, Christian. So when her sister and parents die, she expectedly goes into a trauma free fall and all her baggage, as she puts it, becomes forever interconnected. What if I have overwhelmed him and he thinks that I just have too much baggage? I was thinking about the best way to allegorize this, and I'm sure someone's done it better, but I suppose a mind suffering trauma is like a broken limb, not a severed limb to be sure. In most cases, with modern medicine and treatment, the limb can heal. It takes nurturing, tending to, it may even need to be reset, and it may never achieve its full strength again, but it can heal. However, if the limb is neglected, allowed to mend at a bad angle, it leads to many other problems down the road. What we see in Danny is a woman far too eager to ignore her own trauma and suppress her genuine feelings in order to appease those around her. Is it though, really? It's still just another obvious ploy for attention, just like every other panic attack she's given you. Yeah, you're right. You are right, yeah, I know. She is constantly seeking approval, even in the face of her own enduring pain and discomfort. But unlike with Lily in the medium, at no point does it feel like Danny's path to oblivion is straightforward and set in stone. I think the key difference here is choice. Danny is constantly being worked by the cult, even long before she arrives in Sweden. She is drugged, she is isolated, she is further traumatized. But every step of the way, she is given the illusion of choice. She is left with a semblance of control. Because most of the choices aren't real, it's hard to say how she would have ended up if she had acted differently in the story. But she does make small decisions here and there. The choice to take shrooms, the choice to keep looking, the choice to stay. Every time she assimilates with a group, every time she ignores her own self-focused instincts, every time she chooses to stomach her own trauma for the sake of getting by, we can read this as an obvious coping mechanism and a refusal to thoroughly and properly address the pain eating at her from the inside out. Dude, we can't take them at different times. They'll be totally separate trips. You went away for us then? You know what? It's fine. It's fine. Babe, I'm, babe. I'm, it's, I'm ready. No, don't it's okay. Rushed. I don't. I don't. It's fine. I'm ready. Many of the choices weren't real, but she still feels like she's in control. So we can read her smile at the end as a sort of fulfillment of a desire, the decision to stay. Lily isn't afforded the same respect as a character. I mentioned I liked sadness at first because there seem to be multiple dimensions to this little girl specter thing we see. She's playful, giddy, and likes having Marianne around. Tick. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. But as the trauma resurfaces, sadness's personality vanishes. After the first two or three scenes in which Sadness appears, it starts to feel like Sadness is no longer acting out of her own volition. And she's not, because at that point of the story and beyond, Sadness, Lily, and the Maw are no longer characters. They're plot devices. Sadness? Is that you? Are you okay? What was that thing? Hello? Hi! Richard! The things they do stop making sense from a character perspective. They just start appearing in places and doing whatever or spouting off whatever they need to keep the story going. The Maw doesn't appear as the result of a choice Lily made. Lily doesn't make any choices. She's the trauma center. She exists legitimately only to have bad shit happen to her and for her potential assisted suicide to be a point of suspense at the end of the story. The Maw comes about and exists completely irrespective of her will or consciousness. On that note, it's suggested that the Maw possesses people to do terrible things, wearing them like a skin suit, as the Maw describes it, but at no point does Lily herself, meaning the physical person, actually do anything bad. Even though as a child she hates Marianne and blames Marianne for their mother's death. I don't need her! She took my mom away from me! I hate her! I wish she was dead! Lily, I... No, it was not my fault. 
she still risks everything to save Marianne from a fire, thus releasing the Maw out into the world. But, but I can't leave her here. She'll die. Kurt, remember mommy? It's all her fault. No, 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 she's my sister. Then set me free. And I will save you both. But like Richard fucks a 13 year old, like with his actual physical body, I'm assuming, and he's considered just as sanctimonious a person as Lily is. That's total bullshit. Part of the reason for this dumb, impotent, both sidesy storytelling is this whole trauma made me do it through line. In the medium, the person is their trauma, and through no medium. <laughs> Can they ever escape their fated path in life? Unless their name is Henry, then they can just choose to be a shitty person, I guess. In Midsummer, Danny ultimately finds her own sense of absolution and renewal through total assimilation with the commune and its traditions. But she is more than just her trauma. The descent we see is not a faded path, but something brought about by a persistent failure or unwillingness to address her deep-seated mental health issues. And the biggest evidence for this, that Danny is more than just her trauma, is that she's not the only one in the film who is thoroughly assimilated into the cult. Danny's boyfriend, Christian, also falls down the same rabbit hole. He is drugged, he is isolated, and he is traumatized. And he makes similar false choices which lead him further and further into the cult's clutches. And just like with Danny, even though the choices are false, it isn't difficult to read his actions as a fulfillment of his own desires. To him, he is largely still in control. We know that Christian is grappling with a lack of sexual and emotional fulfillment in his relationship with Danny and that he feels like Danny is a burden. Okay, well then you can bitch to us about how much you regret it for that day and then we'll remind you again that you've been wanting out of this stupid relationship for like a year now and then you can find a chick who actually likes sex and doesn't drag you through a million hoops every day. Okay. Do, do, do you think that there is a masochistic part of you that is playing out this particular drama to avoid the work you actually need to be doing? What work do I need to be doing, Josh, exactly? Well, I don't know, your prospectus, maybe your PhD. Wow. But we aren't given any sort of hint of particular traumas he might be suffering from. Unless I missed them. It's possible I missed them. That doesn't mean that they don't exist, but from a storytelling perspective, the road from his baggage to cheating on Danny and selling out his colleagues feels like an extension of his own will. And if he did take that book, I just pray you understand. We don't associate as friends of his or collaborators or anything. We would just be so embarrassed to be connected to this in any way, shape, or form. Lily isn't responsible for her trauma, nor is she responsible for the death caused by the Maw. Even her releasing the Maw was an act of selflessness brought about by her desire to save her little sister, whom she hated, from a fire. That day when the fire broke out at our house, I made a deal. The part of my soul that was tormented was set loose. You mean the monster? But why? To save you. It helped us escape the flames, but in return, I had to set it free. The game sets up Lily, then Marianne, as these messianic figures, martyrs dying for our sins. And in doing so, it creates an ending that makes very little sense and holds the victim to blame for a world of death and depravity she played no role in. It all starts with a dead girl. Oh, wow. Huh. Wow. Look at that. 
and locked a new color. So we're actually not going to begin at the beginning here. The game doesn't even begin at the beginning. It begins with this dead girl line, which is actually spoken at the end of the game. But I'm going to be jumping around just to detail how much of a slog this game was for me. Much hay has been made over the rumor that Bloober Team might be making their own Silent Hill game. Yes, Bloober Team, a studio I've long criticized for its hackneyed writing, fumbling of themes, and cliche-riddled horror design, may very well be working on a remake of Silent Hill 2, or at least some other form of Silent Hill game. This, in my opinion, is deeply unexciting news. Firstly, I think that the Silent Hill series was clearly the inspiration for the medium. Both games centre around being summoned to a location to face your past in a horrifying monstrous form, unlocking old memories and coming to terms with who you are and why you are who you are. It's a puzzle-heavy game featuring an otherworld mechanic, albeit with some differences, and a terrifying unkillable evil that lurks around every corner. I can understand people thinking that the medium is emulating, or at worst, copying Silent Hill. Fast forward to 2020, and Bloober Team are promoting their upcoming game, The Medium, which is literally just Silent Hill. Looking at the trailer, you can see the real world, other world split, an iconic aspect of the game series. On top of all this, Bloober Team somehow got Akira Yamaoka involved, the musician who defines Silent Hill's soundscape as well as the producer of a bunch of Silent Hill games. Plus, all the art for The Medium's Hell World is heavily inspired by the Polish artist Dziesław Bekszynski, right down to the T-shaped crosses he used in several of his paintings, a fact which Bloober Team are unabashedly touting in their marketing, as though their utter lack of creativity is a selling point. It's superficial creativity, where the style of art is valued over its substance. But in my experience, while the influence is definitely there, it definitely wasn't emulated very well. Now I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest Silent Hill buff, I've played the first three games once each and... Wait, hold on. Hold on. Hold on, almost there. Almost. All right, uh, this just in, I just replayed Silent Hill 2 again for this video. Clearly I like wasting my time. I like Silent Hill as a series and as a concept, and I kinda love Silent Hill too, even though I hate the fixed camera angle and all the enemies and some of the puzzles are obtuse as hell, and every game has like the worst boss fights ever conceived, but no bullshit, I do really like the Silent Hill series. Its presentation is top notch, and it's one of the few horror games that legitimately scares me and consistently keeps me on edge with its incredible environment and atmosphere and sound design. So it's honestly weird to think of the medium as a wannabe successor to Silent Hill because it doesn't capture the feeling of Silent Hill at all. I mean, I guess it gets the annoying fixed camera bullshit. I get fixed camera angles, I, especially back in the old days when there weren't good control schemes for managing the camera, I understand. And they can be done really well. The medium uses them to make these incredibly beautiful and cinematic establishing shots of the various locations. But I don't know, maybe it's just me, I always end up getting incredibly confused when dealing with fixed camera angles. I lose my sense of depth perception, my spatial awareness, it's hard for me to tell what's interactable and what isn't interactable, what's the intended route and what isn't the intended route. So many times I just don't fucking know where I'm supposed to go next because the correct path or interactable object is obfuscated by the fixed camera angle. But I genuinely don't know if that's my fault or if it's something I should hold against the game because it happens in like almost any game with a fixed camera angle. Anyway, the medium frustratingly does everything in its power to dress up the fact that it's a walking simulator. And there's nothing wrong with being a walking simulator. Journey is a walking simulator, right? And it's fucking amazing. But this game seems really ashamed about being one, so it throws in all these really stupidly basic puzzles and interactions. And I am not kidding when I say that maybe 80% of this game is just walking around trying to find the thing you need to interact with. I think one of the things that makes Silent Hill so scary is that despite being relatively linear, it gives you from the start an oppressively large area to explore and interact with. Unlike with the medium, 
the exploration in Silent Hill is a critical part of the gameplay loop. You simply do not know where you're supposed to be going at any given time. And while that sounds frustrating, and it is, the Silent Hill games rely on that sense of confusion to build mounting dread and even a bit of panic as you cautiously make your way through the hostile world. At any given point, you can only see about six feet ahead of you, even if the fixed camera isn't being a piece of shit. So you never quite feel safe. A lot of your time is going to be spent checking doors or creeping through tight corridors or mashing the X button to make sure you didn't miss the thing that's going to propel you through to the next area or impotently running around the hotel because you inspected the fountain but didn't inspect it at the right fucking angle so you didn't realize that you missed the Little Mermaid music box in the very first area of the fucking dungeon. <sighs> Sorry. Every locked door is a chance that some enemy is going to inch just that little bit closer from around the corner, or just kill you before the screen fades in. <sighs> yeah, this game. And in that sense, this is a slight tangent, but in that sense, I feel like Silent Hills really captured what Silent Hill is all about. For some of you, that may have sounded like total gibberish, but Silent Hills was a playable teaser released by Hideo Kojima a few years ago. It's not made by the same team of the original Silent Hill games, and it was eventually canned, but the playable teaser still sort of exists today a little bit, even though Konami's been really trying to take it off shelves, digital shelves for some reason. Anyway, Silent Hills manages to get at the essence, the core of what I felt at least when I was playing through the first three Silent Hill games. The liminal space skirting the reaches of reality, that feeling of confusion, of being lost, of frustration, of thinking that the entire world is one big, overwhelming, and somewhat nonsensical puzzle that you need to solve. I walked. I could do nothing but walk. And then, I saw me walking in front of myself, but it wasn't really me. Watch out. The gap in the door. It's a separate reality. The only me is me. Are you sure the only you is you? The sound design, the environment design, the darkness, the dread in suspecting that around every corner lies some unfathomable evil just waiting to capture you. The medium doesn't come close to that in my experience. The medium's environment design and art design and blocking and acting, they're incredible, like really stunning at times. But at no point do I feel like I'm playing a Silent Hill game. The game asks so little of me and the points that are supposed to be the scariest, namely when the maw is stalking you, are more annoying than anything else. Like, it's invisible, and it senses you through sound, and you have to hold your breath to become invisible to it. So you imagine this, like, Death Stranding-esque thing. But it doesn't have nearly the amount of depth that it needs to be as thrilling as Death Stranding is. The mechanics don't seem to make all that much sense when put into practice, and these movements are very transparently just there to break the monotony because the maw doesn't exist out of very specific areas of the game. Maybe you can make some sort of comparison to Pyramid Head, but every time Pyramid Head showed up in Silent Hill 2, I was like, oh shit, what the fuck are you doing here? Unless it was a boss fight, in which case I was like, oh shit, here we go again. With the maw, it's more like that second reaction. Like whenever the maw shows up, you sneak around and run through a doorway and it loses all awareness of your existence. This isn't complex game design. It's just an obstacle thrown in here and there to pretend this game isn't a walking simulator. With Pyramid Head in the exploration sections, he's like an even more powerful enemy than all the other enemies that are already stalking around. It forces you to think twice about how you're going to get around the area. It's not like that in the medium because there really is only one way forward. Most of the sequences with the Maw are those stealth sections and there are quite a few chase sequences which are... <sighs> I'm not a huge fan of one hit kill chase sequences in horror games because while they may be energetic, they're rarely scary and they tend to be more style than substance. They can be decent at shaking up the pacing or transitioning from one location to another, but while they're artistically very stunning, they're not terribly compelling for me. 
There's this one point where you're playing as Thomas, Marianne and Lily's father, and there's this creature skulking about below you, so you have to knock down some very specific bookshelves to carry it away. And the game pretends that this is a stealth section, but even though the HUD warned me that the thing could see me, the environment design and the way the thing behaved made me feel like it couldn't. Can't get me up here, can you? Maybe I was just playing the game wrong, but either way, this whole part felt like it was just on rails. There was this other part in the same Psyche tour where this butcher shines a red light which can damage and kill you, and I legit have no idea how I was supposed to get through this part. I brute forced it. Maybe you're supposed to use Henry's shield power, but at no point did I recall the game teaching me that the shield could be used to protect him from weird brain spotlights. It was originally only used for deflecting Richard's hentai nonce tentacles. At the end of the game, the maw blocks your path, and... This stupid fucking sequence, I swear. Both times playing this game, I got pissed off by this. The way I solved it feels so stupid and half-assed that my brain instinctively refuses to accept it as the correct solution. Basically, Marianne can force an out-of-body experience which allows her to explore the spirit world in her spirit body without moving her physical body. Let go. There. A fuse box. You've seen in the footage a split between two similar looking planes. One is the living realm and the other is the spirit realm. Some of the quote unquote puzzles revolve around unblocking barriers in one realm to proceed in the other. My favorite of these is probably the grandfather clock sequence. It felt very Phoenix Wright, which I liked. Is that Thomas? But beyond that, there's very little the game does with the concept that justifies Bloober Team filing a fucking patent for the parallel worlds mechanic? Fuck you, Bloober Team. Anyway, so there's this stupid fucking encounter at the end. What I did was use the out-of-body experience to lure the Maw into this room that leads nowhere so that Marianne in her physical body can run up and pull a switch to electrocute the Maw and exit the area. I cannot stress enough that this solution is so fucking stupid. Number one, the fixed camera angle. The way the side room is framed makes it seem like there's something important you have to do in there, not just run in there to fool them all like a dog not realizing you never threw the ball. Number two, this room is so small that if you fuck up, the maw will very likely catch you, so it really is an exercise in trial and error more than anything else. Number three, how was I supposed to know that I could interact with this random blue button? I thought it was just part of the environment, even on my second time through. The door is clearly shut, so it makes it seem like there's something roundabout you have to do to get it to open, not just press the button right next to it. Number four, the button electrocutes the maw? How was I supposed to know that that would happen? And why is it so weak to electricity? This is the second time we've had to use electricity to get rid of it. Marianne just made that up. Is it a water type? So yeah, Silent Hill this ain't. Silent Hill tasks you with so much more, all the while piling on the sense of dread as you run around the oppressively huge town and tight corridors. There's a great degree of minimalism at work in Silent Hill's environments. It isn't trying to look pretty. It's a labyrinth, and unlike the maze-like world design of Resident Evil, where each area is made to be distinct and flow within the larger structure, Silent Hill is all too happy to lead you to dead ends and samey looking hallways. Sometimes you miss a gun, sometimes you miss a map, and Silent Hill doesn't dwell on those losses. It's the player's job, after all, to explore all the town's secrets. The medium doesn't capture that sense even in the slightest. If it's trying to be Silent Hill, it definitely doesn't understand it. The medium's atmosphere is simultaneously beautiful and macabre, but because I'm just walking through it, it's not exactly tense or compelling at all. There's no major sense that I'm completing any real puzzles. There are small puzzle rooms, but the answer is always somewhere within the room itself, and it rarely requires very much thought. For the most part, you're just moving along the narrative hallway. There are a few points in the game where Marianne has to, you know, commune with spirits, because she's a medium, to help them pass on to the afterlife. To do this, she needs to find the spirit's name and mask. She does this with Richard, the child eater, and with Henry's demon, as well as some minor characters. And the way this plays out in gameplay just feels so shallow to me. Like, Richard gets this big, long apology tour, but for this guy, whose name I can't even be fucked to check, she goes into some fucking conference room to find out that he sits across from this other guy, and that's all she needs to help him pass on. 
Good morning, Marianne Spirit Medium speaking. How may I assist you? Mm-hmm. Okay, and what's his name? All right, and would he like to buy your premium death mask? They're on sale. Buy one, get one free for a limited time. All righty then. Brandon, it's time to go. All right, ma'am, Brandon's passed on. You can rest easy now. Take care. This other lady is a performer who uses a stage name, and in like five minutes, Marianne discovers that her manager is abusive, her relationship with her husband was cold and loveless, and her real name is Victoria. And she had to make a lot of assumptions. Like, I would find it just so funny if she gets to the corpse and is like, all right, Tori, here's your mask, time to pass on. And the spirit's like, my name's not Tori, you bitch. The cool detail about this is that when spirits die, they forget their names, which is why sadness goes by sadness. I I'm sadness. Marianne. Sadness. Is that your name? I mean, you seem pretty cheerful to me. Well, it's what I remember. Um, my friends used to call me by a different name. But I don't remember what it was. It's the only lingering sense she can recall. Although, I feel it's worth noting that sadness and depression aren't the same thing. I feel like for a girl who's been through as much as she has, the name sadness as an allegory is understating it a bit. Though, maybe it works because at first she doesn't remember the nature of her trauma. But also, why does sadness even exist if Lily is still alive? I, I don't really get that one. Maybe I've just missed something. The game has this one fucking jump scare, and it's like the only one in the game, but it's so fucking stupid and out of nowhere and loud and unfair that it pisses me off to no end. Besides that, the game doesn't do much that's all that compelling in a mechanical sense. You get to go on these tours of people's psyches, like the Rapist's Apology Tour, which is really just an excuse for the game to show off a little more of its environment design while you walk around on rails through what is essentially a virtual museum. What you may also notice as you progress is that Marianne never shuts the fuck up. Hey, old timer. Now, what's a fine machine like you doing in a place like this? Hope you don't mind if I, uh, pop your trunk. Although, this could come in handy. Locked. Obviously. There's gotta be another way. So began the great dumpster heist of I'm starting to get tired of Some your shit, Some things don't just Eva. go away. Hey. Uh, 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 better be worth it. She comments on literally everything. I hate when horror games do this. Any tension you are building up is immediately lost when your protagonist makes some inane comment about the 17th thing that you interacted with. I much prefer the Resident Evil and Silent Hill style interaction where a simple voiceless subtitle is displayed describing what you're looking at. You can even throw in a bit of what the player character is feeling. The disembodied description removes the friendly presence from the room, making the experience lonelier and more unsettling, while still conveying the same information about the object. Even in like Resident Evil Village or the Resident Evil remakes, Capcom uses the protagonist's voice sparingly, usually just for high intensity moments when it would make sense emotionally for the protagonist to have something to say. Otherwise, when the character is talking so much, it's like the game keeps telling me how I should feel. Sometimes I can't interact with things while she's talking, but even if I can, I still feel I need to wait for Marianne to finish so I don't miss anything important. Kinda sounds like a spy name. Cutters. Bolt cutters. Or a movie star, like in a movie you don't use your real name for. Yeah. Spy name it is. And I'm not one of those players who thinks that waiting for shit is the worst thing in the world. I think it can do a lot in building the pacing and tension and other stuff that's really cool. But I ended up getting real sick of Marianne having to say something about every little thing I picked up. Go away or I'll scream. Clever girl.
Oh, it's you. Yeah, I'm James. <sighs> Angela. Angela, okay. I don't know what you're planning, but there's always another way. As far as how Silent Hill handles trauma compared to the medium, I come back to my point in bringing up Midsummer. How one deals with trauma is a choice, and the characters in Silent Hill, James, Angela, and Eddie, all have agency over how they cope or refuse to cope with their personal struggles. I'm not going to pretend to be the biggest expert on Silent Hill 2's story. It's very esoteric in its presentation, and I've only played the game through twice, so I haven't seen all the endings or secrets. I do really like the story of the game though, and I feel I have a basic understanding for what thematically is going down. But if you want a more in-depth comparison, I think Mert KK and James Stephanie Sterling's videos do a far better job than I could to break down how the medium falters where Silent Hill 2 succeeds. All in all, the medium was just a real slog for me. It's doing some things really well, mostly in the realms of environment design and art direction, but as a game, it's a walking simulator that doesn't want to admit it, so it draws out all these sequences to pretend like you're achieving more than you actually are. It purposefully obfuscates its story in a way I don't find satisfying, and when all is said and done, I think the game fumbles over its themes and concepts, trying to say something deep or hard-hitting, but failing really to say anything anything coherent or worthwhile at all. Fun fact, I'd also played through both Remothered games for this video. Mercifully, they're pretty short. I'd also never played them before, but I thought they might be relevant to this video. Uh, they weren't. Uh, not in the slightest. But the good news is I recorded my playthrough, so I'll have all that footage for next month's video. The bad news is I'm going to have to push back the Black Book video unless something changes because, guys, that game was like 40 hours long. And I want to play through it again because there's shit I missed and multiple paths you can take, but like really, if you want a solid deck building RPG with Witcher-esque lore, you should get Black Book on Steam. Hashtag not spawn, but honestly, I wish I was because the game is that good. Thanks as always for bearing with me. Hope everyone's doing well, staying safe, not letting the bad, awful, horrific times we live in get you down. Remember to find someone to talk to if you need it. If they think you're a burden, they're not the right person for you. That simple. Okay, I'm done. Take care. Bye, guys. See you later.